Pete Feenstra on the Pete Feenstra feature for Get Ready to Rock Radio. Tonight we're speaking to the one and only guitar phenomenon that is Chantel McGregor. Hello. We're in a, hi Chantel, we're in the uh, heart of South London because you're down here recording your second album in five years. Yep, absolutely. And uh, have we got a title for it yet? There's no title, it's that new there's no title. And uh, you've been recording how long? Two weeks so far. Um, the bass and drums are done and the guitars have just been finished this week and now we're on to vocals. But there is a strand of continuity going back to your original debut album. Yeah, I'm working with the same about. producer, Livingston Brown. Um, yeah. He's fantastic and yeah, it's just rocking so much, it's brilliant. And um, have you got a, a whole bunch of ideas that came together as, as a kind of whole corporate composite vision for the record? Or Pretty much, yeah. It's um, The style of music's evolved quite a lot and this time it's a lot more of a concise thing. You know, the first thing there was pop stuff, there was a bit of blues, it's quite there was a bit of rock. Various, yeah. yeah, whereas this one it's, um, it's a lot more concise, so it's pretty much just rock. Um, with a couple of acoustic songs and it's, it's just a bit more contemporary and modern and sort of more in the vein of like Black Keys and Royal Blood, that sort of sound. Stripped down a bit. Yeah, a bit more raw. And uh, are you going in as a band to record the whole thing or are you doing bits and pieces and then? It's really weird the process of doing it. Um, it's You do it as a band yeah. and then you sort of, that gets your drums done basically and a guide vocal track and then you do the bass parts and then you do the guitar parts again and lots of overdubs, layering, massive guitar sounds, and then you do the vocals. So you've got quite a good handle on the production side of things yourself, apart from yeah. having Livingston. <laughs> I do, yeah. I enjoy doing the production thing, so at home all the demos and stuff I do the production for, and then take it to Livingston and say, this is my vision, and he makes it into a CD, so. And what was his response to what you brought to him? before you start recording. He was so pleased. Um, I think the thing is, since the first album, I've grown so much as a musician, as, you know, producing things, everything. I've grown completely. And um, I was talking to him yesterday about it. It must be really weird seeing how much it's evolved in three years. You know, I've gone from being, you know, going into a studio and playing what a producer wants you to play to going, well, actually, I'm going to play this and I want the bass player to play this and the drummer do this. <laughs> And, you know, it's well, that's the natural evolution of being an artist and, yeah. and working as you do, consistently on the road. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking about that, are any of the, have you played any of these songs yet on the, or have. sound checks or anything like that? I have. It was really, It's gone so fast. This is the weird thing. Um, I'll step back a bit. Um, yeah. Basically, I I set out a goal of right. I need a new album. I've got ten weeks to write this in. So I set myself, because I was going on holiday in August, so I was like, right, I'm going on holiday on the 6th of August or 12th of August, it's got to be done by then. So I had 10 weeks and that was my end goal, was Spain. Right. So <laughs> that, right. that was the, you know, the reward. So I did it in 10 weeks, I wrote 10 songs in 10 weeks and right. they all made it onto the album. Yeah. And everybody always says, you know, you've got to write 300 songs to get no, 10 you do good what you ones. Need to do, obviously, yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, but that just means that you're writing a load of rubbish ones. So just make sure you write good songs. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, hopefully I've achieved that. Um, yeah. So we've got 10 songs, went into a rehearsal studio for a week. Um, Leading worked, into this, right? Yeah, yeah. Worked constantly for a week in the rehearsal rooms from like 10 in the morning till 10 at night. Um, then we went on tour um, and did a full seven, I think we were away for, it was like seven days, seven gigs in seven oh. days or something like that. So every night it was basically I want to do a full original set, so that was the first album and the second. So there were no covers, so everybody got a big shock and we're like, what, all these new songs, ooh, yeah. which was brilliant. They've been percolating for quite yeah. a while then. And everybody loved it, they really, really enjoyed it, so that was so much fun, it was great playing them live. Um, and then we had a bit more rehearsal time when we got back and then went straight into the studio. Right. Um, we can't play anybody anything from the new record yet because it's not complete, but let's go back to your debut album. Uh, do you want to pick a track from that? Yeah, let's go with Fabulous. It's a good upbeat track. <laughs> Yeah. 
from the uh, Like No Other debut album by Chantal McGregor who we're talking to on the Pete Feenstra feature tonight. That album came out five years ago as we've already said. I it's think it's five, five years. years. Yeah. It's three years, isn't it? Well, three years. I beg your pardon. Your career's been going since 2009 <laughs> and the record came out a couple of years You're later. Aging, yeah. Pete. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but you, you've taken your time over the follow-up album. Was, yeah. was that because, as we've just talked about, that you were kind of evolving and in a sense looking for your own style because yeah. I think the interesting thing that everybody is drawn to in your career is that um, separate question almost but you kind of uh, you've deconstructed the whole rock thing really you can play it as well as anybody mm. but you kind of come come to it in an understated way and come to it from different directions as well so yeah. has it has it been difficult for you to find your own style doing not, it that way not particularly the thing is i've always done my own thing i've always wore dresses i've always approached rock as a thing of like don't ask for it to be a big masculine thing with your feet on the monitors and you know you don't have to do that it's a bit of a stereotype for me it's a cliche and a stereotype and i just look at it and go it's about the music yes it's about image but you can carve your own image and it's about you know the music's got to be the fundamental thing that's got to be first class and then you can look at the image and go well you know the girly thing it's a unique selling point you know there's not that many girls wearing lovely long dresses getting up there and shredding out of a guitar you know it's it's what it's the unique thing with it I suppose um, and yeah that's sort of always been my thing um, I mean the, the new stuff's really really rocky it's I mean it's bordering on metal and grunge in some places which I've always been into, you know. And you've played it live as well yeah. at moments of your set, yeah. Yeah, you know, the set is primarily a rock thing. It's not really anything else. You know, the, yes, the acoustic bits sing a songwriter, but, you know, the main band thing is probably bordering on heavy rock. It's brilliant. Um, you know, it's 
it's how it is but I think the the growth I think has been a fundamental thing for the last three years and also the time factor because we've been touring so much it's yeah. actually the physical process of sitting and writing a song you've got to be at home you can't do it in the back of a van scrunched some, some people do of course but I mean yeah, that, you're not comfortable with that I'm not comfortable with that I like sitting on my own in my shed writing on my own yeah. with you know nobody sort of saying oh do this or do this and I need to lock myself away to do it um, that, that was one of the really difficult things that I found when writing was because I, cause obviously I run the business as well so dealing with the business side of it dealing with interviews dealing with you know, travelling for the gigs and booking yeah. the hotels and sorting yeah. the itineraries. You've got all so these things. So how do you keep fresh? I mean, how do you keep inventive outside of that? Because that's a grind. It is. You've got to shut off. That's the only way you and can do it. that's exactly what you're talking that's about what I now. To do. Yeah. yeah. I literally locked myself away and said, right, this is what I'm focusing on. And I'm not dealing with the emails, which I got a bit of stick for. You know, people on Facebook, you've not replied to me. And it's like, well... Yeah, it's all instant. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if you know. want an album, then I can't reply. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, that, that was a big thing. But I think the delay was down to the, the physical time that I had. You know, we were so busy touring and doing all these other things. There's just no time to write. Plus, you know, the, the other instant thing about this, or, or possibly the other instant thing about this, is that, of course... Everybody is in such a rush to put out product. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to mention names here, but we all know who they are. They're, they're banging out three or four albums a year yeah. just to get press, just to get gigs, yeah. almost. That the actual, the art side of it has almost kind of drifted away. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a current problem. Um, and I do see it as a problem. You know, people... No, I think so, yeah. People are banging out stuff so quick that the quality control's not there. That's another issue. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just think that you've got to step back and, you know, yes, it's not going to be an album a year for some people. And, you know, the ideal thing would be an album a year, but I don't think people forget you that quick. You know, you can... Not when you're touring as hard as you are. Exactly. And I think you can step back and say, well, I'm not going to put out something until it's ready, until it's right, and it will be a good quality product when it's done. Yeah. I'm not going to rush it. Yeah. You know, the original plan was to get this album done record it in two weeks and have it out by the end of October, which in hindsight was really foolish because it was like, there's no way you it's can get happen. that done and get the quality right. Yeah. Um, you know, and just the whole promotion of it and stuff like that through radio and pluggers and stuff, you've got to give that three months. You yeah. can't just say, oh, well, there you go, there's a CD out now, can you play it? And, you know, you've got to think about these things. This is uh, Pete Feenster talking to Chantel McGregor on the Pete Feenster feature. Let's play another track from like no other. It's your choice. Ooh, let's go with Cart Out. Maybe she can rock 
talk about a brand new as yet untitled album uh, let's talk about influences when, when you uh, and going back to your days at Leeds Music College and all the rest of it back in that was 2009 I think that was a long time yeah ago. yeah <laughs> but um you, you unbelievably got a first not unbelievably you're a very very talented musician and you quite it was great that you did that but were you did you feel isolated in your musical influences at that time or did you have a whole bunch of contemporaries that were into the same sort of stuff you were? It was a very isolated thing for me with uni because I was touring, you know, I was gigging. Even then? Yeah, I was doing my degree and gigging and it was like, well, you know, my friends would say, can you come out on Friday, we're going to a party or we're going out drinking and it's like, well, no, because I've got four gigs this weekend, so I don't have time, I'm sorry. So, you know, that was a tricky thing of making friends at uni. I had a few close friends and that was it because I didn't really see the point in going out and getting really drunk and naffing up my degree. When you're paying that much for a degree, Plus you, you want got to your gigs to do. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, was, it was a time of basically just cramming everything as much as I could with education and music. But that was more, more the practical element. I'm thinking more about the actual musical influences that you were interested in at the time and, and your peer group at the time. Because let's face it, a lot of people, I guess, would be into the more indie kind of stuff, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, and, and you've always been musically diverse in what you draw on. Yeah, it's... I think if I'd have been closer to the people at university, then their influences probably would have been stronger. Um, but because I wasn't socially in them circles, I was still doing my own thing. And my influences come from, you know, friends who put something on in the jukebox in the pub, you know, when I go out when I've got some time off. Um, yeah. You know, or somebody will say, oh, have you heard of Hosier or Royal Blood or whatever? And I'll be like, no, but I'll check them out on Spotify. And to be honest, Spotify is the best thing in the world. I know musicians go off on one saying, oh, well, you get no money. And it's true, you get no money from Spotify. Mm. But as an artist, you've got to reverse it round and go, yeah, but you can... Marketing tool. Yeah, it's a brilliant marketing tool for one. 
and for influences it's amazing because I just go on there put in I don't know Ryan Adams I want to listen to Ryan Adams but what's similar to Ryan Adams and do you find they come out with the yeah the stuff that you would consider mm. relevant and I've found so many artists that I've never heard of that are phenomenal yeah. that have influenced yeah. even stuff on this album that nobody else has ever heard of probably but and you kind of do that on YouTube to a lesser extent yeah. as well but yeah. without people giving you the direct yeah, links, I suppose. It's, it's just brilliant. It's great. And, and what about people that you've actually you do so much touring? We've we've talked about that. What about the people that you've met on the road or seen? Anybody that's particularly impressed you or influenced you in the last couple of years? I'm trying to think. Um, or are you just too busy working, turn up, play, go home? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's always, it's the nice thing is when you do festivals because you get to see other people play, which is fantastic. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think because we've seen so many bands at festivals that I really enjoy listening to and working with as well. Yeah. Uh, we're friends with mostly Autumn. Um, yeah. They're a brilliant real band. Proggy. Yeah. yeah. They're a fantastic band. So we like working with them and we like, I like listening to them. They're great. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the, the best ones I've seen for the last year or two. So you, you, you kind of uh, you spread your focus quite wide in that respect. I really do. Yeah. I, I listen to anything. You know what I'm like. I, I listen to you know, rock and pop and yeah. jazz and everything. So we just we've just we talked about your the fact you like getting involved. Self as a kind of pathfinder then? No. Because you have broken the mould. <laughs> you know, you've, you've broken through all the cliches in, in, yeah. in a very small C conservative industry. Yeah. It, I, don't, I don't know. I don't really think you of just get on with as it. groundbreaking or anything like that. You just do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's. Yeah. I don't think, oh, well, I've broke the way for girl guitarists or anything daft like that because there's a million girl guitarists done it before me. You know, you look at Bonnie Raitt and you go, well, she wears nice clothes on stage. She's a girl guitarist. She's been there before me. She's been around a hell of a long time. and still very, very relevant. She's, oh, she's great. awesome. She's so nice. She's lovely. Chantal, let's play another track. Uh, um, your choice again. Ooh, let's go with, are we allowed a long one? Yes, we can do that. Let's go with Daydream. This is the one everybody's been asking me to play. <laughs>
Tom McGregor there and Daydream, that's fantastic. Uh, how did you come to that song? Um, it had been in the live set for a while and um, it, it was one of them songs that it changes every night. Whenever we play it, it evolves and it becomes something more and it gets longer. And it's, um, so I think we've had it up to like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, that song. Because it just, every night, because we jam it, it's all improvised is the solo section. So. You know, some nights if I've been listening to some of quiet or jazzy or whatever, we'll turn it on its head and say, well, let's play it a bit more mellow tonight. Um, and because me and Keith, the drummer, we, we bounce ideas off each other while we're playing the songs live on stage, which is sometimes a bit risky, but it's so much fun. Um, you know, it changes and it's different and fresh every night, and I think that's why I enjoy playing it so much. And it, as I say, it's one of the... Your fans' favourites. It is. I think it's great yeah. uh, because it kind of showcases everything you can do and, yeah. and changes as well, and it's exciting and all the rest of it. Yeah. Let's talk about the band. Let's. Uh, who are the band members and how did you meet them? Um, I've got Richard Ritchie in the band. Um, he I met when I was about twelve playing jam sessions, and um, he he used to get up. I used to get up. So uh, about three years ago, four years ago, I can't remember. Um, I needed a bass player, so I saw him on a website and was like, is that him? Sure, okay. He was in Russia at the time, so he came back from Russia. Are you playing uh, over there? No, he got married over there, right. um, so he was living over there. Um, but he came back and we started working together in things. So that's Richie, and the drummer's Keith McPartling, and he's great. I've known him two years, two and a half years, something like that. Um, but he's, he's great, great drummer. Really nice guys, fantastic. Just as important to get on with everybody socially as it, it as is them being great musicians, I suppose. Yeah, you've got to be able to sit down and have a chat and a bag of crisps and a beer with them. And above all, they've got to have the commitment and the time to do the road work that you do. There is, yeah, <laughs> we do so much, it's crazy. I think we've got like 43 gigs between now and Christmas. My goodness. So it's like, you've got to be committed. Either that or you need committing, I'm not sure which now. <laughs> 
And and how do you kind of motivate yourself night after night? I ask this to other other people who tour a lot because it's a, you know, it must be a. It, you could almost have a trap there that you fall in yeah. sometimes and not necessarily become complacent, but even bored sometimes. I don't know. It's. I think the thing that gets me is the travelling. It's so tiring. Yeah, That's, everybody says that. Yeah. That's, yeah. And and hanging around. That's the famous quote from yeah, Charlie Watts. The way yeah. in it's oh god. Yeah. It's, it's one of them things, it's not rock and roll, you know, everybody says, oh, you must be loving the rock and roll lifestyle, and it's like, well, it's not really rock and roll, isn't, you know, getting to a venue at five o'clock after you've sat in a van for seven hours, getting there, you know, bored in a van, and too hot in the van, in the stuffy van, and then you get to the venue, you do the sound check, and then you sit for two hours waiting to play. Yeah. Yeah. And then you do the gig, and then you do the meet and greet, and then you do the pack down, and then you leave at about midnight, and then you travel seven hours to go at the next gig. But I guess at some point you must pour the frustration into the actual playing side of things. That's that's the thing. It's the you know one and a half hours on stage where you go, this is bliss. I am so happy. I'm loving it. Yeah. I can let out any emotions that I've got on stage for one and a half hours and put everything into it. And do you see it as a performance? Do you see yourself as an artist when you're up there? Do you see yourself almost detached from the everything that's gone before? Pretty much. It's a really strange sensation. I mean, I've, I've talked about this before. Where it's like an out-of-body thing. Yeah. It's weird. It's like being another person on stage. Yeah, well, we try to say that after mm. gig after gig after gig after gig, you suddenly could almost stand aside from yeah. while he's playing there, yeah. It's, it's really weird, and you're playing, and I come off stage every night, and I have to say to somebody, whether it be my dad who's driven the van or anybody, how did I do? Because I just don't know how I've done. I don't know what I've played, I don't know how I've played it, if I played it, you know, what was this solo like? I have no idea, because it's like an out-of-body thing where you're just playing and feeling it. Let's play one more track. i got to think what was on the first album. Um, let's go with... I'm no good for you.
was Chantal McGregor and I know good for you. We're, we're here busy talking about the brand new as yet untitled album. Let's let's go back to Livingston Brown, the guy that's uh, ostensibly the producer on the record. Mm -hmm. Um, to what extent does he actually mould the ideas that you give him that we've talked about? He's brilliant. He's, he's one producer that I absolutely love working with because I can give him a vision and say, this is what I want, this is what I want it to sound like, this is what I want the tracks, the guitars to sound like and everything. And he knows just how to get it. And he knows... It, it's not just about pressing record. That's the thing. You know, production's not about pressing record. That's engineering. Production's about somebody sitting there and saying, well, try this, double track this, do this back in vocal line, and pulling the ideas out of your head that are all swimming around in your head, but you just don't know how to manifest them into something. And that's well, his job. And that's a producer's job, is going into your mind, getting your vision and deconstructing it and working out how to make that into a record. And yeah. he's brilliant at it, he's so yeah. good at it. But, but your conception of that and your understanding of that, did that come about as part of your music course all those years ago? Is that something no. that you've learnt since? It's, it's really funny because I started working with Liv when I was 15, I think. Right. Um, so I knew him from way back when I was young. And, you know, we were doing some songwriting together and production stuff together and whatever. And I used to go down to the studio there in a studio in Nottingham as well and I spent a good few years doing that. So my studio education really stems from being sort of 15 to 18. And that's when you kind of absorb a lot of exactly. it as well. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it, it's really bizarre because I think people look at studio and they think, oh yeah, you just go in and play it and it's, you know, you play it and that's it. And it's totally not that. It's a completely no. different no. thing to live and it's, it is the downfall of a lot of people is that they're not used to studio work and they don't get it and they don't get that you can just play how you play live and it'll sound great because it never does you know you've got to adapt and you've got to say well I'm going to play it with less distortion because distortion doesn't work on track you know you can add it but you can't take it away once you've started playing with it so and so things like talking about that things like guitar tones you yeah. into all that kind of side of things yeah you, you've got to have a dynamics but, I mean, on stage, I use a really high gain amp. You know, it's really distorted, it's really rocky. On recording, you can't use that because it's it's too much on a recording. You've got to roll it back and play it with no reverb. You can't have it with reverb. But, but you you don't feel hemmed in in that respect when you go in the studio and you can't do it, those sort of things. I think a lot of people do, and I think that's a lot of people's problem, is that, you know, they're, they're not in their comfort zone because they've not got the sound that they are used to. But for me, it's about what's best for the recording. So you learn to adapt and you learn to play with less distortion and you learn with no reverb and you go, well, I'm not using my effects because they can always be added after, but you can't have them taken away once you've recorded oh, with them. Oh, yeah. um, And it's a different world. It's a different ball game of studio work. So do you consider yourself a, a guitar geek? Probably not, no. I know what I like and that's about it. And... and Broadening that question, do you consider yourself just a musician or more of a guitarist than a musician or a songwriter first or, or an element, all those elements together? Or? I've never thought about it as such. I just think of myself as Chantelle. I play guitar, I, sing. Are. <laughs> I write songs, I enjoy it, I enjoy doing production, I enjoy listening to music. And I think that's the thing is, I think as an artist you've got to be a full thing. You can't just be I think you're artist. certainly that, Chantelle, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and, and Livingston that we're talking about there, he, he came, I guess the connection came about through Robin Trow, did it? No. Oh, um, right. It's from Although he did play bass with him. Yeah. He did play bass with Robin, yeah. yeah he still yeah. does um, some stuff and records all Robin's albums, which is great. But as I said before, I've known him since I was 15, and uh, it was through a mutual friend in Nottingham that I was working with doing some other production stuff um, that we met. And um, I mean, as, at 15, I don't think I'd ever heard of Robin Trow, so it was like. Yeah. You know, when when I found out about that now, or you know, three years yeah. ago when I did the first album, I was like, ah, oh, cool, let's put Daydream on the album. And An inevitable question that people have asked me to ask you is, you, you, you play with Clapton yeah. a while back, Eric Clapton, yeah. how was that for you? He was lovely. He was a really genuinely nice person. And how um, was it musically? Well, I didn't actually jam with him on stage, no. which I would have loved to have done, but he went on before me. Uh, it was at Cranley Arts Centre, because right. um, they do um, a charity event with Paul yeah. Jones, he organises it. I think it's every two years or every one year, I can't remember. Yeah. 
um, and it was a fantastic night. You know, Paul was playing, and he got up with us on one or two songs. It was just brilliant fun. Great band, great fun. Absolutely excellent. I want you to choose another song, but something not of your own. Okay. Easy. Um, Royal Blood, and I can't remember the name of it. It's the last one on their CD. There's nothing left inside final track from okay. Chantel's debut album Like No Other because she's recording another one now. Next time we speak we hope to play exclusively some of the tracks from the brand new album. What's it going to be Chantel? Yeah. This is Free Falling. This is Free Falling and this has been Chantel McGregor. Thank you and good night. <laughs> Thank you. 
So hard to please me, all you do. 